Happy Sabbath to everyone. I want to say welcome to those who are with us in house and those who are viewing us online. Indeed, it's a blessing to have the beautiful sunshine. I want to thank Mark for his wonderful singing, reminding us of face to face, we are going to be with Christ. That's the ultimate theme and hope of Christians to see Christ face to face. And the time is winding down, the window is closing for that time for us to meet Christ. Can you imagine you have somebody to meet at the airport and you're counting the date? The time is winding down, the window is closing. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this Sabbath, this opportunity to meet in this fashion, to study your word unmolested, be with those who are online and those who gather to worship you wherever they are. We pray your blessing be upon us and hide me behind the cross and let Christ be lifted up as we seek to prepare for your coming. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's now, I'm going to spend 40 five minutes with you so it's 10 40 now so i go up to 11 30. that's it 11 30 15 uh 11 25 yeah to be exact 11 25 all right so we are just doing part two of this message for those who weren't here last week. We are going to use five minutes to do our revision, and then we proceed to where we left off. The window is closing, if you can see it on your screen right there. That's our topic. And it's not a literal window we are talking about, but we are talking about a window of time. So the window is open, but gradually it is closing. So we're looking at a window of time. So as we do our revision, we talk about the Noahic age got a window of 120 years in the time of Noah, that they got a window of 120 years. We discovered that last week. Uh, the Jews, they got a window of time of 70 weeks, according to prophecy, it works out to 490 years. So God is merciful. With Noah, it 120. With the Jews as a nation, they got 490 years. And at the end of that time, sad to say, they reject Christ. They crucify him. They stone Stephen. So for us today, we also got a window of time. Uh, so we recognize that there's a work to be done. There's a preparation for Christ coming. But there are some conditions that must be met. Uh, when Christ was here, he told his disciples to meet in the upper room. And he's going to give the Holy Spirit so they can do his work. Uh, we of ourselves can't do this work. There are many persons out there need to be rich, but we need God's help. We need his Holy Spirit. So the Spirit comes in two forms. It comes in the form of rain. And this week we had some rain. But, so we have the early rain and we have the latter rain. So for us to receive the early rain, the condition was repentance and baptism. Then our sins are remitted, are removed. Then we receive the Holy Ghost. And we discover, we talk about what is remission, that our sins is, for your sins to be removed, we need blood. And Christ shed his blood for us. Hence, our sins can be forgiven. All right, so we read this text, Matthew 26, and it said, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. The law of God cannot save us. So let it be known that 
we as Seventh-day Adventists, as we hold up the commandment of God, especially the Sabbath, it cannot save us. It just points us to the Savior, which is Jesus Christ. And because Christ lives in us, then we can keep his commandment, but we of ourselves can't. So once we go against God's commandment, all of us deserve to die. And the Bible says all of us have sinned. Hence, all of us deserve to die. Because the law requires that once you sin, you must die. It requires your life, your blood. Because the life is in the blood. Hence, Christ came and died for us. So we don't have to die for, it, for ourselves. Because we can um, atone for ourselves. So Christ's blood is shed for us. For our sins to be remitted. To be forgiven. To be removed. So that's what we uh, talked about last week. And so to, 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 to be receiving of God's spirit, we must be prepared uh, physically and also mentally. When we got baptized, when we accept Christ in baptism, we bury the whole man. So we are saying we are not walking with the world anymore. And we uh, repent of our sin and we confess our sins. So... That's what we looked at last week, and let me proceed to where we left off. Also, last week you we talked about the season of distress. Uh, a trouble is coming upon the world. And my heart goes out for many persons who are suicidal, and many persons have committed suicide. And Judas in the Bible have committed suicide. And we know that when you commit suicide, you go to a Christless grave. So my heart pains me that the world is in this condition right now. There's a work for us to do. Every single person out there needs to be reached. We don't know who is suicidal sometimes. They may be driving and look good, dress good, everything. But we don't know. So there's a work to be done. A trouble is coming upon the world. And Satan knows this. But for that time that is coming, Virgin, we have to pray. We have to pray one for another. Satan recognized that the time is short. And last week we were here, and we are here already. It is the same 24 hours in a day, the same seven days a week. But God is cutting the time short for the elect's sake. The season of distress and anguish before us will require a fate that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger, a fate that will not faint though severely tried. The period of probation is granted. So when we get probation, it's a time. We get a time. Uh, when God made man, there was no time to their existence. There is no death. But because of sin, God say, I, I give to man three score and ten. Today, some person, they barely make it to 20. Whatever time we live for, 42, 48, 50, 20, 75, that's our probationary time. What are we using it to do? It is granted to all to prepare for that time. And Jacob prevailed because he was persevering and determined. His victory is an evidence of the power of important prayer. Prayer is what's going to keep us, brethren. We have to pray one for another, not for ourselves. Many times we are struggling. We are going through. We feel like giving up. And even many of us have, have think suicidal at times. Yes. But guess what? Prayer, brethren. Pray. Pray one for another. And right, right at the edge. So I'm traveling from here. And just at the hedge, I'm stepping off the victory. I reach right here. It is possible for me to give up. So don't think that we are safe and we are all comfortable and that, yes, we are in heaven. We are not in until we are in. So let us pray one for another. Let us encourage each other not to give up. So prayer is very important, and this quote is from the Great Controversy. So conditions for the latter rain. So we talk about the early rain. Uh, there's a work to be done, and the work that is to be done, we can't do it of ourselves. 
The disciples wanted to do it with self. But I love God. God allowed them to grow because they were with Jesus and they were still not converted. And that is why Jesus said to Peter, When thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Peter was walking with Jesus and he had his sword. Yes. <laughs> he, he took his sword and cut the man. He, he was not trying to cut his ears off. He was trying to go for the neck. <laughs> but the man was so skilly, he got his ears. So he wasn't converted. He wasn't converted, brethren. And we are coming to church. Are we converted? God is not giving up on us. Let us not give up on no one, brethren. Let us pray one for another. So the work that needs to be done is to share this gospel. The only hope for the world is not a new president. It's not a new bank account. It's not a new house. The only hope for this world is Jesus. And Christ came to shed his blood. And he gave his disciples a work to do. But before they could do the work, they need the Holy Spirit. So he told them, go to the upper room, wait. And then the Spirit came and they were empowered. And when they were empowered, this gospel was taken to the entire world. That was the early reign. But the work is almost finishing. That was the beginning of the gospel with the disciples in AD 31. We are now living at the end of time are the time of the end. And this work must be finished with a blaze of glory. Ellen White says it's going to be ten times. Can you imagine Peter, his shadow, right there, his shadow, ill persons, his kerchief, ill persons. Philip went to the Ethiopian eunuch. And when he finished baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch, he was transported not by a plane, not by Air Canada. He was transported by the Spirit. And that's how God is going to work with us in the last day. Greater than what happened with the disciples. So this is the, this is the time in which we are living now, the time of the latter rain. And the lesson that we are going to study today is a very powerful lesson, Mark. Very deep lesson. Uh, we're going to get into it. And we're going to see something here before we close. So, to receive God's latter rain so we are living in the time of the latter rain he said pray for the rain the latter rain in the time of the latter rain we're not living in the time of the disciples now and the time of noah are the jews we are living in our time so we need the latter rain to finish the work so for this tree to grow you plant the seed you can't pour a lot of water on it what will happen it will drown the seed. Okay, so let me give you an example here. So we, we have this tree. We plant the seed. The tree is not there. So we plant the seed. We have to give it a little, just a little. And it starts to spring and grow. For those who do farming or planting, it starts to grow. And when it comes mature, then I can put more on it, more, bigger drops latter rain. So the work to be finished, brethren, it's a greater work than what the disciples did, so we need a greater power than what they received. So God wants us to give us the latter rain. So for us to receive the latter rain, what is the condition? Repentance, conversion, blotting out of sin, and then the times of refreshment. So let us get into the meat of the matter window of time that we are living in as Seventh-day Adventists. The window is closing. Repent ye therefore, this is Acts 3 verse 19. Acts 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So there are four things we are looking at. Let us just go back to it. Four points. Repentance, conversion, blotting out of sin, and times of refreshment. We're going to take them one by one as we go. So the first one we're looking on is repentance. Number one, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. So if you repent, it must be seen. There must be a sign. You can't say you repent. You, 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 take, my, you take my book from me. But you repent and you still don't give me back my book. That's not repentance. 
If you take my book and you repent, give me back my book. That's repentance. Matthew 9. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eat at your master with publicans and sinners? Why? Listen, why Jesus did that. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Physicians are for the sick, not the whole. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call righteous, but sinners to repentance. So repentance is for sinners. Then came to him the disciples of John saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast half, but thy disciples fast not? So because we sin, brethren, we need to repent. And sin is the transgression of God's law. So that's one point we discover that repentance is for sinners. And all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man received sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he had found it, he laid it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he called it together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repented, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Acts 5.31 he might God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. So repentance is a gift. You and I can't do it of ourselves. We are struggling, brethren. We are going this way, but we need to make an about turn. We can't of ourselves. If you're trying of yourself, you're going to fail. It's a gift from God. Ask him for it. He will give it to you. So repentance is a gift. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then unto God also the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. It's a grant. Do you want it? The government is giving a grant. Are you going for it? <laughs> All right. No. But the grant that Jesus is giving us, let us go for it. It is free. It's a gift. Go for it. Ask him for it. Repentance. Whatever you are struggling with, whatever I am struggling with, Pray and ask God to give you that gift. It's a gift. Ask him for it. For further study, we can read all of these texts and it tells us about repentance. Um, uh, repentance is a gift. Repentance is to turn. You can't say you repent. You're going this way. You're stealing. You're lying. Whatever you're doing, and you, you, you say that you repent. You can't be going the same way. You have to be going... This way, that repentance is to turn. Repentance is sorrow for sin. You know, a person can say they repent, but they really don't sorry. They just do it because, like Judas, he went and threw back the pieces of money, but he wasn't genuine. Repentance is to be renewed. That's point number one. Let us move on. Our second point is conversion. Our second point is Conversion. Psalms 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. What brings conversion? The law of the Lord. You can't be converted. The, the change that the world is looking for cannot happen without the law, God's law. Marijuana can't do it. Alcohol can't do it. Tobacco can't do it. Sex can't do it. The only thing that can bring true conversion and let you feel relaxed and relief is the law of God. That's what the Bible says. Isaiah 6 verse 10. Make the heart of these people fat 
and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. So when you are converted, you are healed. What alcohol do? It just brings you into a frenzy and you feel nice for the moment, but you are not healed. So when you are converted, you are healed. And that's what we want. We want to be healed. And James 5, verse 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, today we see a lot of persons erring from the truth. Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. So when you are converted, you, you move from one state to the next. From error to righteousness to truth. Psalm 51 verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall be humbled himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What do you know from, about children? Well, the lesson Jesus teach her that one of his children, based on what I know, they don't hold grudges. You just beat that child, and a few minutes that child come and hug you. But we as adults, at times we hold grudges and malice. And Jesus said, unless we become like little children, so there's something to learn from the little children. Unless we are converted and become like little children, humble ourselves. Children are humble. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired to have you. So let us move Simon's name, put your name, put my name. Andre, Andre. When Christ used a word twice, it is for emphasis, it is established. Simon, Simon, Andre. Andre, behold, Satan had desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. Are you praying for somebody? Pray for me. I'll pray for you. Please, I need it. That he may, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So if I pray for Ivan and, and she's converted, and Ivan pray for Ingo, and it, it goes, all of us can be healed. Pray for somebody. Whenever you're praying, call somebody's name. No matter what. Don't make a prayer without calling somebody's name. Call somebody's name. Make a prayer list. All right, so let us conclude on the second point of conversion. Only God's law... Only God's word can bring about conversion of the soul. Conversion brings healing, and conversion is turning from error. All right, our third point, blotting out of sins. And this is what many persons think can't happen, and this is the whole plan of salvation. This is the whole plan of the sanctuary to blot out sin. The issue is with sin, and God wants to blot it out. Let us proceed. Blotting out and writing of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So when something is blotted out, it is put out of the way. So God wants to blot our sin out, he wants to put it out of the way. That's what the Bible says. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not written with the righteous. So when something is blotted out, it is not written. All of us, Whatever sin we commit, it is recorded in heaven. Angels take the record with their pen. And Ellen White says, before the end of the day at evening worship, we should confess our sins and ask God to forgive us. Because the angels want to take the record to heaven. But the record that he wants to take 
the record that the angel wants to take to heaven should be clean. These are sins. But guess what? They need to be removed like this. Clean. That's what God is working on now is in the sanctuary. That, that's the whole purpose of the antitypical day of atonement. To blot out our sins. To have it removed. But sad to say, if we don't want to let go of our sin, God don't want to do this. But... God, what God wants is to have a clean sanctuary. And for the sanctuary to be clean, sin has to be removed. But sin is there because of us, because sin is in us. But God is doing an operation, and he's trying to cut sin away from us. But he doesn't want to damage us. But if we are not willing to give up that sin... For God's sanctuary to be clean, he has to put us out. You don't want that. I don't want that. None of us want that. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him, neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let this posterity be cut off. And in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. So when, when, your name is blotted out is that your, pros your posterity is cut off. No more. Your name is blotted out. I can't imagine it. I, sometimes I don't think about it. If you don't make it to heaven, brethren, you're forgotten. There, there's nothing more about you. That, that's it. No, I don't want that. I can't think about it. I want to be in heaven. I want to be with God. We don't want to be cut off, brethren. We don't want to be cut off by God's grace. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgression, and as a cloud thy sin. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. We can read these additional for more information, but we'll proceed. So let us conclude on our third point. Blotting out of sin is putting it out of the way. Blotting out of sin is that it is not written anymore. So for sin, so for sin to be written, if I don't sin, nothing can be written. So for sin not to be written, I have to make sure I don't sin. So hence, we can live without sin. Amen? Amen. By God's grace. Praise the Lord. Blotting out of sin is cut off. In the ancient sanctuary service on the Day of Atonement, anyone found with sin was cut off from Israel. God is in heaven now doing the atonement, and he's trying to get rid of sin. That's the whole purpose of the atonement, to get rid of sin. Since 1844, this is a very iconic uh, year for Seventh-day Adventists. Since 1844, and this is the next study we can go into personally, but since 1844, this is according to Daniel 8, verse 14. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. God wants to cleanse the sanctuary. Not the earthly sanctuary. That's done away with. We are dealing with the heavenly sanctuary. And every person that take on Jesus' name is written in the sanctuary above. Every person, whether you are a Presbyterian, a Baptist, a Catholic, whatever denomination you are a part of, once you take on Jesus' name, your name is written there. And God is going through the judgment, and he's going through every single name. And he's going to judge you according to your motive. And listen, even person who used to be worshiping on Sunday, they will be saved because they never know better. God judge you according to your knowledge. So leave all judgment unto God. But for those who know truth and don't walk in it, God is going to judge you. Because if you disobey truth, then you're going to be in trouble. So since 1844, we are living in the antitypical day of atonement. God is currently blotting out our names or our sins from the records. Which do you want to be blotted out? Your name or your sin? By God's grace, I want my sins to be blotted out, not my name. 
Since 1844, God is going through the records of those who are dead in Christ. And the first person is with our hand is Abel, the first righteous martyr. Abel. And God is doing the dead. He's going to move from the dead to the living. The period of 1844 to 2023 today, we are living in a window of time of 179 years as Seventh-day Adventists. But that window is closing. It's closing, brethren. Our last point before we close, our final point, our final point before we close the window on this message. Time is more than one. It can mean two or two million or two billion, according to English. Time is infinite and time is relative. Genesis 27, 36, and he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he had supplanted me these two times, which is more than one. He took away my birthright. All right. Genesis 31, verse 7, And your father had deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God, suffer him not to hurt me. So we see right here that time can mean, time, times is not one. Time is one. But once it mentioned times, it's two, three, or more, or whatever. I will bless the Lord at all times. That's infinite. His prayer shall continually be in my mouth. So in the context of Acts 3, verse 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The refreshing comes twice. The refreshing comes twice. These are additional reading we can read. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, who heard the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as a small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. So God compare his, his doctrine to the rain. But the land withered, he go to possess it, a land of fields and valleys, and drink it water of the rain of heaven. A land which the Lord thy God carried for. The highs of the Lord thy God are always upon it. From the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. And it shall come to pass if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments. Which I command you this day to love the Lord your God. And to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. That I will give you the rain of your land in due season. The first rain and the latter rain. How many rain is that? Two. That thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy oil. These are all figurative of the work that God wants to do for us. But we need the rain. We need the first rain and we need the latter rain. We are now living in the time of the latter rain. I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle that thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed to yourself that your heart be not deceived. And he turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless he perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth. This is literal, but it can also be symbolic or spiritual. If we disobey God, he's going to cause us to suffer because of our disobedience. But if we are obedient to him, he will bless us. And we want the spiritual rain. We want the Holy Spirit. And God said, if we disobey, he's going to shut up the heavens. So, brethren, if we are praying and walking contrary to our prayer, then God can't give us his spirit. And hence, it is we who are holding up God's work because God needs us to carry this work, this message to the world. But he needs help. Proverbs. In the light of the king's countenance is life, and his favor is as the cloud of the latter rain. For he said to the snow, Be thou on the earth, likewise to the small rain and to the great rain. So we have two rain, the small rain, the great rain, the early rain, the latter rain. So the spirit comes in proportion. 
the spirit comes in proportion. When we come to the church, we do not know everything at the same time. We grow as Christians. We grow in grace. Zechariah 10 verse 1. You can read this in your spare time. Zechariah 10 verse 1. Very wonderful text. Ask ye of the Lord rain. When? In the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone grass in the field. And that is why we sing this song, showers of blessing. Showers of blessing. When should we ask for the latter rain? Tomorrow? No, no. Why? Ask for it in the time of the latter rain. And I'm going to show you before we close that we are living in the time of the latter rain. You can't ask for something when the time is not right. Ask for it when it is right. And that is why Jesus said, go to the upper room. To the disciples, go to the upper room and ask for the Spirit. And he said, when the fullness of time was come, they were filled with the Spirit. God work on time. We are now living in the time of the latter rain. And in Zechariah, the Lord said, we must ask. Seek. Knock. Ask. Why do we... Why is it that we don't have? It's because we don't ask. When we go to heaven, we're going to see a lot of gifts. Placed there in heaven, a lot of gifts. And the, and the gifts you're going to have unclaimed. You never claim it. God can't give it to you unless you claim it. Let us claim these gifts in Jesus' name. Joel 2. This is a promise. And this, is, this promise was fulfilled in parts. In the time of the disciples and in our time. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he had given you the former rain moderately. When something is done moderately, it is done in small proportion, and it will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see vision. This fulfilled AD 31 with the disciples. That's the first part. But we are looking for the fulfillment in our day. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. God wants to give us his Holy Spirit, brethren. You can read additional reading, Jeremiah, Hosea. But I'm going to read for you from Life Sketches. Uh, page 411, Life Sketch is one of the books that Ellen White wrote. Very uh, important book about her life experience. And I'm going to read a quote for you from it. And this is from page 411, paragraph 5. You can find the book and read it for yourself. Since 2001. And this is based on the lesson we are going to study today in Revelation 18. Okay? So I, let me get your mind prepared now. So God has given us three angels. And when we study these messages, it's not literal angels flying out there. The first angel, the second angel, the third angel. It's not a literal angel. The angel represent messengers. So the first angel that God sent with a message, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. This angel represent the Millerites. The Millerites were preaching from 1798 to 1844. The judgment to come was in 1844. And they were preaching this message. Preaching this. These are the angels. The Millerites and his associates and persons all over the world. You can read it in great controversy. They were preaching. These were the angels. Then there's a second angel saying Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen. That angel also represents the Millerites. So the first angel arrived 1798. The second angel arrived 1844 in the summer when the churches, but then all the different Protestant churches, when they reject the message that William Miller was preaching, they became Babylon by rejecting the message, the truth. But there's a third angel, and the third angel arrived 1844 in the autumn. The third angel is a representation of Seventh-day Adventists. The third angel message is, if any man worship the beast at his image, the third angel message has to do with the Sabbath. And this message has been preached since 1844 till today. But there's another angel to come to join these three angels in Revelation 18 verse 1. That's the emphasis of the lesson. 
This angel is to come. Revelation 18, verse 1. Revelation 18, verse 1 to 3. Has this angel come? Who is this angel? Let us read the quote. Now comes the word that I have declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave. So this is what they say Ellen White say, but she never say that. This I have never said. I have said as I look at the great buildings going up there. Where? New York. Story after story. What terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terrible the hurt. Then the words of Revelation 18, 1 to 3 will be fulfilled. When did those towers went down? She said, when that happened, that angel will come. Let us continue. That's a twin tower, and that's 2001. <laughs> I am proud to be a Seventh-day Adventist, and I'm not afraid. I'm not hiding it, and I will tell anyone anywhere I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And this is God's church. Brethren, don't be afraid to be Adventist. Don't be afraid to identify that you are a part of God's true church. Yes, there are other churches, but guess what? They will have to come and join this fall. And that's the work that God has us to do. And God has given us a prophet. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Ellen White. Yes, she's a prophetess. God ordained her, and she wrote this brethren. Can you imagine? She wrote this over 100 years before it happened. She saw the towers in New York going down. She writes about it, brethren. Why is it that our church is silent? Why is it we are saying nothing about it? We need to talk about it. She writes about it. But I have no light in particular in regard to what is coming in New York. Only I know that one day the great buildings there in New York will be thrown down by the turning and overturning of God's power. The Lord is soon to come, virgin, in fire. Do you hear a fire in Alberta? Yes, fire was in B.C. also. Flood was in B.C. And earthquake in, in other places of the earth. What are these? God is warning the inhabitants of this earth of his soon approach. Oh, that the people may know the time of their visitation. Israel did not know the time of their visitation. Christ was there. The baby was there. The priest took the baby, Christ, and he did not know it was Christ. That's bad. But the wise men know. The men from the east know. But God's people did not know. Is it possible that Christ is so near and we are a church every Sabbath and don't know? Yes, it's possible. Oh, that the people may know the time of their visitation. We have no time to lose. We must make more determined efforts to lead the people of the world to see that the day of judgment is at hand. And this was written in 1904. When I was lost in New York, I was in the night season called upon to behold the buildings rising story after story toward heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof and they were erected to glorify the owners. Higher and still higher in the buildings rose, and in them the most costly material was used. Yes, this is true. She talked about the fireman and the fire engine. Oh, God, is so awesome. Listen, the scene that next passed before me was an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty and supposed fireproof building and said, They are perfectly safe. But these buildings were consumed as if made of pitch. The fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. The firemen were unable to operate the engines. Let us conclude today. The refreshing is the rain. The rain represents the Holy Spirit. The rain or the Holy Spirit comes twice, which is times more than one. The refreshing comes in the form of the early and the latter rain. The early rain began in 31 AD on the day of Pentecost. Since 2001 to present, brethren, we are living in a window of 22 years. What I'm saying that since 2001, God is looking for a people. And the people that God is looking for, is looking for them from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Because sad to say that God cannot use the entire Seventh-day Adventist Church to do the work because we are not ready.
So he's looking for a particular set of people in the Seventh-day Adventist church who are obedient to his will. And sad to say, I have to tell you that these people are the 144,000. He's looking for them since 2001. Are you willing to make up God's army? He's looking for you. He's looking for me. It is not son the law holding up the work, Bridging. What is holding up God's coming and the work is us. Because God can't find us to make up that number to do that work. The window is closing. That's what I'm saying, Seventh-day Adventists. We are living in the time of the latter rain, the time of the refreshing. Are we meeting the conditions to be filled with the Spirit of God? Today, we are going to make two appeals. Those who are not baptized Seventh-day Adventists. If you're listening to me out there, you're not a Seventh-day Adventist. You want to know more about who are we? What is Seventh-day Adventist? You can call us at the Nelson Seventh-day Adventist Church. We can study with you and we can show you from the Bible why do we do what we do, why we keep the Sabbath according to the commandment. You can learn more. But the next call is for those who are baptized Seventh-day Adventists. You're sitting here today. You're listening as a Seventh-day Adventist. God is waiting on you. God is waiting on me. God needs your service. There's a work to be done. There are people need to be saved. And this evening, we are going in the community of Nelson to share with them. We can't sit here and expect a person to come here because they don't know that we are here. We have to go. And that is why the Bible says, go, go eat into all the world. Go. You can't sit, Bridget. The Bible didn't say, come. He said, go, go tell them, go call my people, go in the highways, go in the byways, go into Nelson, go into Castlegar. Where are you going today? I'm going with Jesus. Let us pray. <laughs> Father, I love you and I thank you. As a people, God, we're struggling. We're struggling with self. We're struggling with sin, God. We want this power. We want this victory. We are tired now. We need to leave this earth and go home. But before God, there's a work to be done. There are people to be saved. Give us the strength. You see our weaknesses and all that we struggle with. We are begging you. We are asking you. You say that if we ask, you'll give us the gift of repentance. So today now I pray not for myself, but I pray for every member in this church today. I pray for the pastors. I pray for the elders. I pray for the president of the conference. I pray for the world at large. I pray for those in Nelson. Oh God, so many persons on the suicidal list. I pray for them. I pray for the sick. I pray for those who are in prison. Your people need help. I pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Pray for self to be surrendered. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. Thank you for your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>